He has been requested by a few folks on social media. Now I get to have him join us on our On The Mark podcast and visually as well for those folks on YouTube and on my website, markimmelman.com. It's John Adler. Hello there, John. How are you doing? Hi, Mark. I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. It's good to have you. I appreciate you changing your schedule to get on with us. That's very kind. Um, all right, let's be, before we dive into the meat and potatoes of this all, John, let's let's talk about you. Let's put you into context for our global audience. Um, tell the folks a little bit about John Adler, please. Okay, well, uh, I started coaching uh, about 20 years ago now. <laughs> started coaching just regular folks, business people. And I learned about uh, non-directed questioning and that sort of thing, and that was very useful. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I stopped playing soccer. I had a knee okay. injury, I, uh, and I started playing golf. So I became interested in, in the same principles I was using with my business clients with what we got. And I started to explore uh, how, what role the mind had. I was lucky enough to be invited by uh, Sir John Whitmore and Timothy Galway to mm. a tennis course uh, exploring the inner game of tennis yeah i was about to say because i've read the galway book the inner game of golf yes mm -hmm. so it was it was based on that but it was a tennis um, setup and me being the only non-tennis player there with many tennis pros i was the guinea pig so they were using me for the bounce hit exercise mm -hmm. and then i went home and, and um, used it on my golf game and i dropped a lot of shots pretty quickly um, and that got me really interested in how the mind then affects performance and focusing, concentration, and that became my interest. Okay. I started to try and explore more for myself how I could improve my focus and concentration. I know, um, you know a lot of golf commentators, probably including yourself, say when it's coming down the stretch, these guys have got to focus, they've got to concentrate. But I couldn't, for the life of me, find a course I could do that I could learn and develop that. So um, the only sort of thing I'd come across was uh, the, the Eastern sort of martial arts thing, they, they sort of pointed you towards it. So I traveled to, to the Buddhist temples and into India and into the ashrams. And I got a, a bit of information, but I eventually found something which has been called the Pasana meditation, the 10 days of silent meditation. Okay. And I did that for 10 days. And I learned more in 10 days of silence about the reality of what my mind's like than I did in all the other courses. And I began to put that into not only just my, my coaching, but also my golf game. I, I practice it myself. I still play. I'm an amateur golfer. I want to know what it feels like to be anxious. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and, I, and I had some success with it. So my principles come from my own experience. It's not just something I've read. And so I've, I've put those principles into my coaching practice. Now I've been fortunate to work with um, elite golfers and with lots of amateurs. And I get a kick out of helping them both. So you've, you've now learned a lot about yourself. Now you're getting into the uh, work with clients and such. I'm fascinated, you know, coming from a guy who's given golf lessons since 1996, I think it was. You're a lot less gray than I am. I mean, you, you must be pretty at peace with what you do, John. Well, I do love my work. I've got to say that. I did it for three for many years because I'm not a golf psychologist, even though I work in that field. Mm -hmm. And neither am I a, a golf pro. I'm not a professional teacher, but I'm a performance coach. So in the beginning, I basically had to give it away because clients were hard to come by. Okay. In fact, I started very much attracting the people who couldn't find anybody to help them, which were people with the yips, full swing yips, and, and shipping and putting yips. And, and they would come to me, they didn't have anywhere else to go. I mean, the pros okay. really sort of scratch their head. Um, psychologists, apart from saying, well, put your shoulders back and be a bit more positive, they didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So they came to me and... Um, they, you know, they were sort of in the last chance saloon where you're just about to give it up. And who should they see in the saloon at Did the you? bar was me. <laughs> with open arms, welcoming them in so that I could explore and learn. And um, I still do a lot of work with the abyss to this day. And in my mind, the sort of uh, mental interference that Galway mentioned, a yipper is the same as uh, uh, a top pro blocking his tee shot on 18. It's mental really? interference. Is that simple? I mean, I, I want you to build on that for a while because it's, to, to me, you know, I, I've worked with players with the yips. I've been around players with the yips. 
And it seems like that sort of career ending sort of a thing. And then like you say, you're equating this to a professional elite golfer just blocking a tee shot off to the right. Is it, is it really that simple? It find that, you know, I'm sure the folks listening find that so hard to believe. Well, if they've been playing well all, all you know, for, for um, 71 holes, mm-hmm. on the last hole, now, now what is it? They lost their skill or is there some sort of mental interference going on? I mean, it's a much, <laughs> it's a smaller scale, yeah. but it's the same thing. A yip is a, is a, is a, is a grand hole. But to me, it's just a similar type of mental interference. There's been some uh, interference in the mind, and whether that comes from doubt or wanting, craving it too much, wanting the result too much, or fear of messing up, um, that interferes with their ability to concentrate. And this is one of the things that I discovered in these 10 days of silence, that the, the differences that make the difference are very subtle and are easily overlooked. Tell me about these 10 days of silence. And, and I want to visit this subject just a second ago, but, well, actually, no, let, let me, I want to build on a, the point that you made. And then I want to talk about the 10 days of silence. You can see me writing over here. Um, a few weeks ago, um, this is in 2021, because this is a podcast and I shouldn't date things. But I was on the course for CBS and um, it's down in New Orleans at the Zurich Classic of New Orleans. And folks, go, we go to a playoff. It's between Louis Oestes and Charles Schwartzel versus, um, I'm having a moment, uh, Mark Leishman and Cameron Smith. Yes. And in regulation play, uh, the South Africans, Louis is on the tee. It's alternate shot. And Louis hits not a bad hook, but he hits a hook in the left rough. They can't get to the green. And uh, they make par five and they go to the playoff. Now, in the playoff, 18 is a par five, sort of slides gently to the right-hand side, bunkers down the left rough, and water all the way down the right-hand side. Now, they come to Louis, who's on the tee again, and uh, the host sends it down to me, and, and I set this shot up by going, well, in regulation play, he missed this one left. You know, and then I make some quip about, well, it's about you know, clearing your mind, you know, getting to the shot at hand, trying to put the past in the past, and just being right here. So I sort of, some, some sort of version of that, I said. Yeah. And lo and behold, here's Louis, blasts one into kingdom come on the right, straight in the water. The playoff's done, essentially. Really? Where there's, and, and, and it's almost like I saw this unfolding in my head before we went there. He'd hit the hook off the tee in regulation. They make five. Now you try and challenge the right side. He overcompensates, even though it's 20 minutes later, 30 minutes, into the water on the right. It is, I, I want you to go there with me a little bit because that's, because because you said that's that was on the 73rd hole of play where up to then Louis had been downright sublime off the tee with the driver well there you go you see i mean i, I can't I, I can't obviously get into Louis's mind fantastic player but um there was obviously some sort of interference and, and he wouldn't be human if, if there wasn't mm-hmm. i mean i think you know if, if you play golf even as an amateur like myself there are good times but there are times where you just get a kick in the butt yeah, and, and and that's the way it is, and that's um, why we love the game. I think, even though we can all do our best to stay present and to clear our mind and and, and, and focus on what we want, the interference. The mind is always worried about something. It likes to be getting involved in things that it doesn't need to, worrying about what's about to happen. And I think hmm. a lot of the time, if you're frightened about what's going to happen, you can't pay enough attention to what is happening. And that's where we lose, you know, we lose concentration and, and performance drops. I mean, I'm sure you could say there's some sort of technical problem. And a lot of the people I see, and a lot of the, a lot of the professionals, certainly that I, I, I've worked with, they were always looking for problems in technique, mm-hmm. always looking for a technical problem. Whereas actually, they broke down before the technique did. Um, and, I, and to me, it's a bit like you know losing your keys in the basement, but looking for them upstairs because the light's better. Yeah, amen. You know, here's me a golf instructor, and this is why I was looking forward to this conversation with you, because I'm saying to golfers all the time, because I come at it from a physical realm, and perhaps the one of the uh, origins of this podcast was the fact that I've eventually, you know, in my 50 years of wisdom, let's call it, come to the understanding that golf and most things are holistic. There's more to it than just your hands and your feet, because every signal, you know, is coming from your mind, every physical signal. And so, I love that term of interference. Now to that, the 10 days of silence, as you call them, right? Quickly d- describe that for us and, 
and because I, I, in my mind, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining you off to uh, some monastery somewhere in Tibet with a robe on. Was it? A, <laughs> talk talk no. about this ten days of silence, because I think a lot of us nowadays in 2021 and beyond could probably use and benefit from some of this. Oh, I think everyone can benefit from it. Uh, and no, I, I, w- I went searching all around for this place, and it, but it was in Hereford, which is a, a sort of sleepy little place on the okay. old border. Um, but yes, I went. Well, well, someone someone mentioned it to me, and when I thought about going for ten days of silent uh, meditation, yeah, I could feel fear in me. I, I thought I, I could just feel the fear, and I thought, well, what am I frightened of? I can't be frightened of silence and myself. For 10 days. So I thought, well, <laughs> but I was, I could feel it. I, said, I mean, my mind was coming up with all sorts of, I can't, I couldn't possibly do that. No, no, I wouldn't. I'm too busy. And, but I thought, well, listen, I've got to go. And, um, it, you know, I went in with an open mind. And how they described it, Mark, was they said that when you go in, um, your mind is like um, a choppy, the surface of a choppy pond, let's say, choppy water. Okay. And during the course of the 10 days, the surface of the water will become still as, as your mind settles down. And then at the end of the 10 days, all the mud and the silt will, will, will sink to the bottom and you'll be able to see the root, the roots of the weeds that are growing and reach down and pull out the roots of the weeds in your own mind. And uh, so that got me interested. Mm-hmm. And, and what happens is you go in and, and they, what they do is they, they close all your sense doors down. That's the idea is, is the mind is always looking for something to distract it. So they try to close all the sense doors down. So it's silence for the whole time you're there. You, know, you can't take any books or have any music or anything like that. There are other people there, but you keep your eyes down. No eye contact. Your eyes are closed for 10 hours a day when you're meditating. Oh, really? Yeah, there's, there's no aftershaves or perfume, so there's no smells, uh, no sound. You don't touch anybody. So they, they're, they're closing all the sense doors so the mind can't escape and get interested in something. Mm-hmm. And over the course of those 10 days, um, you go through um, some suffering, but when you come out of the suffering, you, there's, uh, it can be a magical experience. And that's what I found it to be. I went in with a very open mind. I didn't have a clue what I was going to find. And it changed everything. It changed a lot of things for the better, I must say. Well, you coined the phrase, and it's on your website. Uh, folks, you can go and check it out, uh, golfisamindgame.com. Uh, you've coined the phrase golf, or well, you just talked about the art of relax, uh, art of relaxed concentration. Is this a skill that you developed uh, during this time? Yes. So being able to place your attention where you want it, I found, mm-hmm. it was a big part of the golf um, industry. They would often talk about sort of where you place your attention. You know, is it internal or external? as if that was the end of the, of the discussion, really. But uh, to me, there was a lot more about how you place your attention, you know, the, the manner in which you pay attention to things, how you attend to things, um, influences greatly the way you view the world. Yeah. Um, for example, people will be listening to this now, or your audience will be listening or watching this, and they'll be paying attention in one certain way. But there's also an opportunity for you to expand that awareness from just the words that you're hearing to whatever you're looking at. And if you're looking at a screen, you can look beyond the screen and look at your peripheral vision and open that up and start to pay attention to perhaps your what you're sitting on, your, the feeling of your body on the chair or your feet on the floor. You pay attention in lots of different ways, not always consciously, but there's always some connection. So that got me, that, that's an interesting part of it. Where do we place our attention when we're swinging the golf club? And even more than that, I suppose, it's who turns up to pay attention? Which version of you is paying attention? I would imagine the version of uh, Louis who turned up on that uh, playoff hole was a different version of himself that was on the on the on the on the front line. Yeah. See? And that's that's the difference. And that's but it's very subtle and it's easily overlooked. Because golf's a, a, a difficult game, um, and even when um, you know when we don't like things, that things aren't going our way in golf, we don't like it, and that causes a resistance in the mind that causes unbalance. Interesting. So somehow, I think we've got to meet the moment that we're trying to focus in, with, in, in the sort of reality that this could be tough. Because if we don't, then there's always going to be a, a disappointment, uh, a 
and that will cause tension. Because how we relate to the moment will define our experience of it, I think. I love that because I read it somewhere and I've sort of taken ownership of it. And I make the quip and folks will look at me and then they, you can see their register after a while. And the, 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 the anecdote is that tension is the biggest wrecker of a golf swing in the world. And people instantaneously think of that in the physical realm. But you're talking about just the, the tension mentally and, and the distraction, if you will, and not being as present as you should be when you're playing. Am I, am I summarizing this well enough? Yeah, I think you summarized it very well. There's, what happens is I think your body is in the present moment. And your mind is worrying about what's about to happen or what could happen. And in the gap, that's where anxiety builds. Uh -huh. Okay. Wow. That's fascinating. Well, that, that, that sort of, I guess that's the perfect segue to, you know, a few of the, uh, the things I want to highlight because you wrote a book a ways back. You've actually got a few uh, eBooks and the one is golf psychology. And one of the folks who follow us on social media um, had read this book and they reached out to me on a direct message and said, this box changed my life and you've got to get John on because I want to hear what he has to say. And so lo and behold, this conversation, and there's a few little elements from the book. I want to touch just uh, to highlight some of them. And one of them was playing your best when it matters. And me being an instructor of elite players, you know, back in the day and, and now being an announcer uh, of the best in the game, um, the ability to bring out your best when it counts is a separator but no one really knows how to do it. And most folks listening to this, I'm sure, you know, your best coming out is like, I'm not sure it might just happen. And then I might have it for a while and it goes away. So I'm keen on your take and to share maybe uh, some insight or two uh, a little bit. Yes. Well, I think, you know, looking at golfers in general, I mean, it does come and go. It's not, not easy to pin this thing down, mm -hmm. this ability to perform when it really matters. But I think, um, you probably know much better than me. There's, there's so many good golfers who travel around on these different tours, but only a few seem to be able to show their ability when it really matters. And I, I, I guess that they have a, an innate ability to just be able to switch on and focus in the right way okay. when it matters. But it's not a skill problem. There's lots of, I'm sure you know, plenty of golfers who've got a huge amount of skill. They can't translate it into performance. So, um, yeah, being able to being able to play your best golf when it matters, there's something about accepting that there will be some suffering before you even start. Um, I, I remember listening to a couple of the, the winners. You, lately, I, 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 I want to interject for a second. That statement you made there, you're actually the bearer of bad tidings. But with that statement, if people honestly grapple onto it, and I want you to say it again. I think that could be what really unshackles them and helps them to bring out their best because they'll be prepared for whatever this golf course and this contest or whatever it is might have uh, in store for them. Well, isn't that the reality of golf? We really never know exactly what's going to happen. We mm -hmm. have to embrace the certainty of uncertainty in order to be able to you know, deal with reality as it is. Otherwise, we're entering into this important tournament or, or, or the medal or whatever it is with an idea of how we'd like reality to be. And there's already a conflict. I want reality to be this way. And reality doesn't always agree with you. And if you argue with reality, my experience is that you lose every time. So Justin Johnson and, and, and who was the other chap, Morikawa, after they were interviewed, uh, when they were recently, did they both been majors? Yeah. yeah. Uh, very interesting to me afterwards. They said you looked uh, pretty calm out there, um, Dustin, and he said, no, I was nervous the whole way around. And Colin Marikama said exactly the same thing. I was nervous the whole way around. They'd accepted that they were going to be scared. They didn't waste their energy trying to get rid of it. They didn't think there was a problem with them and that they shouldn't be feeling it. They just said, let it be there. Now let me get on with what I want to do. I want to play golf. Let me see if I can focus my attention on where I want to play with as much freedom as I can, knowing that this fear was going to probably try and mess them up some, some, now and again, and there would be some suffering. They've accepted the suffering beforehand. I like that. Yeah, and I think on a real deeper level, um, I will let you quote on this because you probably know a lot more than I do, but the body responds with fight or flight, whether you're excited or whether you're fearful. 
And if you're like, all right, well, what I'm feeling is anxiety or fear, you know, my body's adrenalizing anyway. So in a, to a funny extent, if I just get over the, like you say, the focusing on the fear as opposed to the focusing on the job at hand, you, all of a sudden you'll redirect all of that stuff, you know, biologically that's happening mm -hmm. and, and turn that into a weapon of sorts, right? I think so. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, from my own experience, and I'm, you know, as a handicapped dog, I still have to play to know that it's possible to play with anxiety mm -hmm. and with, with the fear, but it'll come and go, it passes. If you, if you can tune into it and don't try and change it and just observe it, non-judgmentally, it's tricky. A lot of people think there's something wrong. I shouldn't be feeling this way. There's nothing wrong. And, and, and they waste energy trying to, you know, stop it. Uh -huh. yeah, I mean, there's no problem in bringing your mind back to the present from time to time and being back in your body. But don't think there's anything wrong and start to, start to panic because that's what does happen. Then you panic. Um, accepting the reality that, you know, it doesn't have to be fun to be fun sometimes. I heard that the other <laughs> week and I thought that was great. That's quotable. It doesn't have to be fun to be fun. Um, yeah, I'm going to use that other quote of yours. Embrace the certainty of uncertainty. And another thing that you touched on in the book, there were various um, subjects. I have not read the book, incidentally, but I plan to. Um, you, you talked about having less frustration when you're out on the golf course. Now, I find golf canny, uncanny because you talk to golfers and you ask them, why do you play golf? And they're like, well, I do it for the relaxation of it. Then you watch them on the golf course and they're everything but relaxed. And they're angry, they're sad, they're emotional, they're mad. There's, you, you run the gamut of emotions in four and four and a half hours or whatever it is. So, so I'm really curious to hear from you uh, to at least try and remove some of the frustration from this whole golf thing. Well, I mean, everyone's slightly different, obviously, and they'll all have their different reasons for being frustrated. But I think most golfers will have uh, an overemphasis on the score. So if you ask them, what's your intention for this round? It'll be to shoot a good score. Mm -hmm. So that's either a yes or a no. And then at the end of the end of the round, there'll be nothing to learn from. Um, you know, there's no um, no learning going on while you're there. You can't develop yourself. It's just did I shoot a good score or didn't I? Yeah. So I always suggest to maybe set a different intention for the round. You know, what can you? What do you need to improve on? Do you need to improve on anger? If so, observe your anger. See if you can let go of your anger. Make that a goal for your round. Um, you know, do you have um, trouble accepting your bad shots? If so, make an intention. So see if I can let go of my bad shots a little bit quicker. Mm -hmm. Having different intentions other than the score, because let's face it, if we could control the score, then we just put 63 down and go and have a beer in the bar. You know, it wouldn't bother. <laughs> be easier, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh -huh. So we can't control the score, but you may have some control over the way you react to everything that's happening. And I would suggest making those um, uh, you know, it's different intentions. And as well as that, accepting that golf is a really tough game. You know, it's a game with really fine margins. And so instead of, you know, I'll ask people what sort of things they say to themselves. And they say some horrible things to themselves yeah. after a bad shot. And I said, can you imagine if you were um, caddying for a young lad and you, every time you made a mistake, you spoke to him the way you speak to yourself. How do you think he perform? And that often it, it puts in a light bulb on. They go, yeah, actually, I, I get what you mean. I said, well, that's what you're doing. You're doing it to yourself, and we all do. Um, but so some self-compassion, I think, is, is called for. Especially when we play golf, the toughest game. We rarely get what we want. Just accept it. The rep, you, uh, you, you should double as a, a minister, the Reverend John Adler preaching. Right now. <laughs> I love that. Um, the, the, one of the subjects in here was developing a calm mind. Now, uh, to, to me, uh, is there such a thing as a calm mind? You, you referenced Dustin Johnson, and I've had the pleasure. I, I know him. I've had the pleasure of calling his golf a little bit. And he is one of those where uh, the he always looks so calm. But you highlighted that. You'd uh, seen the quote where he said he was nervous the entire time, but he just looks awfully disinterested in success or failure when he plays. And it's mm. a wonderful place to be. He hits each shot on its own merit. Sometimes mm. he hits shots when he's not even completely prepared. I've watched him hit shots where he's pulled the trigger before his uh, brother and caddy, Austin, has had the yardage ready for him because Dustin's like, oh, let's just go, all right? And, and it shows you a guy that's just like, you know, it's just one shot. It's not going to define my existence. And 
and in a funny way, it's it's like the perfect way to play the game in, in, in a strange way. So he looks like he has the calm mind, or is it just less concern for what might happen? Well, I think that that probably that is leading you towards a calm mind, less concerned about what's about to happen and being mm-hmm. more present to what is happening. Um, it, it makes for good golf. I think we're we're all guilty uh, as, a, as a as a race of overthinking. There's so much information around. It's not a lack of knowledge, but uh, it's a lack of application of, of some of the simple knowledge, which is don't overthink it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, keep it simple. Keep it uh, Keep connected to what's important and, and uh, set the right intentions and and, uh, and go and play. And, and, and I think letting go of unwanted thoughts and sticky trains of thoughts, which, you know, like donated in the water and all these sorts of sticky thoughts, I call them, that seem to plague us repeatedly. I think you can learn to develop the skill to, 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 to let go of thoughts a bit quicker. And this is what the, uh, the passionate did. How do you... You know, that sounds so great on the exterior, but I want to, I want to dive into the weeds a bit with that observation, the letting go of thoughts, you know, because you've talked about the yips. Um, yeah, there's golfer A um, standing over a putt shot and it's, there's just no, no way from four feet that this ball is going to touch the hole. So how does golfer A step out of this and go, well, I'm going to let this go and get to the business at hand is are there tricks tools or is this just you know practice all of the time and and getting yourself more into the present and the doing of it and again i don't know uh, uh, tricks or tools but there are tools i mean for my part uh, being able to um, bring your mind back to the present moment is a skill that i developed in the fashion in these 10 days of silent okay. meditation so i'd always recommend a little meditation practice even if it's only 10 minutes a day all right um, just just because it's all you're doing is setting an intention to pay attention to something, let's say your breath, and, and noticing when you're there, and when you disappear, your mind always comes up with a thought, it doesn't take long, and noticing it and then bringing yourself back. Oh, okay. It's so useful for golf to let go of, you know, I just hit a bad shot, I'm pissed off, I can't say that, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm angry uh, because, because I, uh, you know, I missed the green, and, and just to be able to go, okay, I'm letting, that, I'm letting that thought go and I'm going to bring myself back to the present again, get back to the moment. That's a skill that you can develop. And um, as for the yipper over that that four foot putt, he has to accept that he may well miss. If he dreads missing or he's desperate to make it, yeah. his mind is already unbalanced. You have to you have to be realistic but optimistic. Well, I may may well miss, but I also I could I could I could make it. Now, what shall I pay attention to? Where shall I direct my attention? Um, you know what's going to be the best way to focus and what's going to be the best thing for me to focus on or things as I make my stroke so that my mind doesn't interfere with my body's innate ability to self-organize and play the shot yeah I think I've found the title for this podcast um you know keeping a balanced mind in the game because you've ref- you've referenced having an unbalanced mind a few times um and it's a lovely way to describe it because at sometimes it's just mayhem inside there and things are moving fast. I mean, I can see that with golfers when you reference the term panic. When panic sets in, um, movements are animated. They might go through their routine, but it's empty. It's like they're on uh, autopilot. And then when things are going well, it's like everything is good with the world and, and the intention is there and the focus is there. But And then all of a sudden, that's fleeting. Like you said, it goes in and out. And then the next thing, they're in this place where it's like disaster and my world's coming to an end. And it's so crazy because there's so many times in golf when the golfer playing with a big lead is the guy who's probably struggling mentally the most, because as soon as someone cuts into that lead, you know, it's like, Oh my goodness, what's going on? Instead of going, well, dang, I've still got a three shirt stroke lead. It might just not be four right now. We saw that in this year's masters with the Deki Matsuyama. Yes. Yes. Dealing with them. Dealing with those mental pressures, I think, come, and, but I think, you know, we can all mess it up. I mean, I don't think uh, anyone's got the, maybe Tiger in his pomp, but hmm. uh, anyone's got the divine right to, to just have it one way. It's, it's like, like life, sometimes the, the, the chips fall your way and sometimes they don't. But yeah. if you have an idea of how you get in your own way, then um, I think you've got a better, better chance of sort of being able to, to, to focus and, and concentrate. And, what, what you said about um, golfers doing their pre-shot routines, I've watched 
golfers from, uh, you know, when they're playing really well and when they're playing really poorly, going through the routine. And you couldn't tell the difference between yeah. whether they were playing poorly or well. So something, it's not the routine. It's not how many waggles you have. It's which version of you is doing the routine. Who turns up? Is it is it the one who's scared or scared of losing his card or desperate to win? Or is it the one who is, a uh, word I love to use in my book, is, is, it's got equanimity. Yeah. You know, just an equanimous mind. And, and, and sometimes players get it when, you know, you hear about people, um, they're playing for their grandfather who just passed away or something. Something beyond the game gives yeah. them a different meaning and they get a different perspective. And they're able to realize that it's just a game. And I can, I, I'm just going to play. Uh, and that sometimes brings people back around. But you don't have to wait for that. There, there are things you can do. Um, talking to somebody like me, perhaps. <laughs> so, or anybody, anybody, anybody who can just put some perspective on things so you can uh, so true. get back to it. Folks who are watching this will see that I'm scribbling fever feverishly. The folks who are listening on audio, folks, people, I'm making notes nonstop here as John is talking to me. There's a couple more points I want to hit, John, before I let you go. Yeah. You've talked about the fear and the anxiety of it. Some look, it's a real part of competition. It's a part of life, really. But dealing with it and and golfers listening to this, helping themselves to a place where, look, inevitably you're going to feel anxious before a round of golf. I don't care who you are. You'll feel nervous before a golf. That is completely normal. But not allowing that you to debilitate you is is something that I think it's also a separate. It's what separates the winners from the not so winners. So can you embellish there a little bit, please? Well, like I said, I think um, you've got to accept that it may well debilitate you, yeah. uh, but it won't last forever. You, you can compound it by thinking this shouldn't be happening or I've got to fix this. I've got to do something. Or you can just observe it and notice that actually I'm feeling really anxious at the moment. Let's see what happens on the next shot. Maybe I'll, 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 I've noticed I'm thinking a lot. I'll, I'll bring myself back into my body and just take a few, just observe my breathing for a while or my feet as I'm walking down the fairway. But asking yourself, you know, what am I thinking and how am I feeling will bring you back to the present moment. And if, if I'm feeling anxious, then just be honest and say, I'm anxious. Okay got anxiety with me but it doesn't necessarily mean i can't play this shot now i'm going to direct all my attention to what i'd like to do i want to see a good shot you know take in the target keep my swing thoughts simple in fact not thoughts keep it in my senses so it's a feeling or, 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 a, or a visual or something and don't overcomplicate it trust your body and, and see what you get and accept what you get and move on because the anxiety won't last all the time unless you compound it. If you just observe it non-judgmentally, my experience is that it, if you notice it's there, but if you don't react to it, you watch. It slowly starts to subside. Mm -hmm. and you'll be able to play for a while, and then perhaps towards the end, when you're doing well again, up it comes again, and you notice that there you are. I was expecting you. <laughs> yeah. There it is. And, and you do your best to continue and, and to play golf. That's what you're there for. But you don't deny it. You can't, you know, you can't resist reality. It's just the way it is, but it's okay. People get so worked up about it that they shouldn't be feeling this way and they lose their head. This is where the sort of mindfulness practice can help a little bit. Just bring yourself back to the body. It's just uh, a big thing. I know of an individual who names the anxiety. They actually struggle with anxiety, <laughs> but they have a name for it. And it's like, oh, there you are, John. You know, just random name. I'm not saying anything about uh, whatever. It's like, oh, there you are. I recognize you. Now I'm going to go about my business. Son. You can be there. Um, I'm still doing me. Uh, is this a well, useful way yeah. to go about it? Most people are resisting anxiety and frightened of it. And my take would be to invite it in like an old friend. Say I was expecting you. I knew you were going to come. I'm not frightened of you. Come on in. and I'll, I'll, I'll watch you. I'm playing golf and you can do what you've got to do. It's a different take on on it you're not, you're not fighting reality well look the reality of it is i mean yeah you you're talking to a guy that you know any given broadcast there's millions of folks listening to what we do and I, I, i'd be lying if i told you i wasn't anxious before a show mm -hmm. but you just got to get up there and go you know if you're so focused on yourself and the way you might be feeling who knows the drivel that might come out of my mouth, yeah. <laughs> my mouth. Well, I said to you before this podcast that I was nervous, and I can feel the nerves in me still. I mean, even though they're not, it's not like I'm uh, mm -hmm. playing a, 
in the medal. But uh, you know, I can feel the nerves, but I can still perform hopefully reasonably and yeah. make myself understood. Um, so you know, it doesn't mean it's the end of the world if you've got nerves and anxiety, or, or it just means that you're doing something that you're interested in and is important to you. Oh, so um, cool. The alternative is you're just watching TV, sat at home, scratching your backside. You know, there's no nerve there. And you the golf, I guess. That, that, that's that's something now I'm, we're moving away from golf but I, I believe that golf is a microcosm of life and this will be my last question and then we can share for folks where they can find your books and find you and all the rest um nowadays you know with the covid pandemic hopefully you know some behind us but but yeah. folks were insular folks were inward folks were on devices you know all that sort of stuff more and more and more because you sort of we weren't allowed out yeah. you weren't you couldn't get into the sun you couldn't go yeah. and exercise that sort of deal I almost feel like there's been a proliferation of this sort of like inward, um, so aware of how I'm feeling kind of thing. And then I, like you say, then I just laser away and I'm in a device and that's an escapism from me. And that's like, okay, everything's well with the world. But all of a sudden when I step out and I step into this that different environment, it's like, oh no, I'd rather just get back into my little room and be with myself and and be safe. Is am am I? Are you understanding where I'm going here? Because I see a lot of this sort of stuff. I am. I, I struggled on the second lockdown over here too, and I think it's something about what I said in the beginning about paying attention, how we attend to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I think even though it's it's comforting to be on the device, it's a very narrow sort of focus. And, and, and uh, it, you know, it closes things down, in my opinion. You're, you know, now we're, we're, we're looking at the screen. And, uh, if you can contrast that with that, I live not far from the beach, and very often I probably would do after this, I'll walk down the beach, and I'll walk down through the pine trees, and I can smell the pine trees, I can hear the sea before I get there. Uh, and then I'm on the beach, and, and you can see the, the, the waves. And that broad focus, you know, there's something about that taking in using all our senses it can be quite overwhelming once we come out of this small thing but that is where you know in, in nature i suppose like a, a big mountain you know a mountain scene or something when we're involved in continually in, in all our senses stimulating that there's almost like a spiritual connection to the world when mm -hmm. you contrast that with a narrow staring at your phone there's a there's a there's a, a different feeling and actually there's a change in physiology and, and um, muscle tension and respiratory rate and all sorts of things come a change when we change the way we attend to the world. And that's part of what, what I do with golfers is find out how they're attending to these shots. You know, how are they using their focus? They're less about where, you know, what they're focusing on. How are they attending to it? And who's turning up to attend? But I certainly get the, uh, I feel a little bit overwhelmed go getting back on the horse and getting back out there with the world as it is having been so introverted so. well fascinating takes oh, and uh, there, there's so much more I'm, I'm so thankful to you for your time already and i know you've helped so many golfers and and i find it sort of curious that a lot of golfers will be watching this on a device so i'm going to say to you once you're done with this podcast and john and they've looked for you you know get out there on the golf course and don't be so about the shot like you say I, I, I remember the quote by, I believe it might have been Walter Hagen, you know, along the journey, don't forget to smell the roses out on the golf course, yeah. where the better you get in golf, the more you're like, well, I've got to make the shot better. And all of a sudden it becomes your entire existence when it's just really one shot. Yes. Don't overthink it. Expect some suffering and be happy. Preach it, brother. Okay, John, where can the folks find you, please? Social media, um, the website, where can they find the books? Yes, please? the website is golfisamindgame.com. I'm um, a bit of a Neanderthal when it comes to social media, but I do have a presence on Twitter and, and uh, Facebook and something on there. But uh, yeah, they can always get in touch with me. I'm very easily accessible. Drop me an email or, or uh, and, and I do telephone coaching sessions over the telephone. And I need people face to face. So. So they can find that on the website. What's the social me What's the social media uh, handles? Where do they? What, what's your name on there on Twitter and such? It'll be uh, uh, golf is a mind game golf on, on both. I think. Yeah, yeah. As okay. I said, I'm not uh, too okay on, on, on the. Uh, well, it's the one thing that I'm doing it because I'm not great on the social media, but I'm sure they can find me if they want me. Well, it's the one thing I love about golf is indeed a mind game. My hero Bob Jones called it. Um, a game that's played on a five inch fairway, that space between your ears. Um, so I appreciate you joining us. Certainly to share your insights and help us get that, uh, this fairway right here, get it manicured and working a bit better. I really appreciate you having me on. I've enjoyed your podcast.